back. Hi. Hello. And what? That sounds like the Seinfeld, right? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. Hello. Somebody's belly button. That's right. Hello. And welcome to Knock Knock High with the Glockenfleckens. I am Dr. Glockenflecken, also known as Will Flannery. I'm Lady Glockenflecken, Kristen Flannery. Are we are we doing a, an appropriate job of trying to make our real names as well known as our fake names? Oh, I don't think that will ever be the case. You don't think so? Glock and Flecken is just too it's, out there. It's, it sticks. It's, it sticks. It's our there. regular names are just boring. Regular Glock and Flecken, when you Google my actual name, mm. like 500 Glock and Flecken things come up. Yeah, that's right. That is your so, name now. It just is. It is. But you know what? When you did that intro, the, the Seinfeld intro, it reminded me of Mr. Bob Bob. Mr. Bob Bob. Yep. That's our daughter's belly button. Well, she calls it Mr. Bob Bob. Mm -hmm. And she makes it talk. She takes her her fingers and squeezes it together and makes it talk. And it's got a voice. It's like, hello, I'm Mr. Bob Bob. We should bring that, um, uh, do like a little talent show for our uh, Thanksgiving celebration with family. And mm, she can, she she can, can debut, or not debut, but she could bring out Mr. Bob Bob. It's been a while since he's been around. What are we I wonder doing what he's for, been up to. What are we doing for Thanksgiving? I don't know. Eating some food, I guess. You always make pie. I do make pie. Yes. Pumpkin pie. You know, make... Libby's pumpkin pie. The recipe on the back of the can. <laughs> it's a good <laughs> it's recipe, my though. Specialty. It's a great pie. It is. It's like if How it's not it broken, don't fix it. Yeah. I just keep making that one. And then I'm also known for my mashed potatoes. Yes. I always have to make those at Thanksgiving. How do you do your mashed potatoes? Um, I like them very smooth and creamy. So you I got use texture weirdness. Yes, I do. We, that should be an episode sometime. We should talk about that. But anyway, the mashed potatoes. If you use a combination of russet potatoes and Yukon gold potatoes, okay, because like yep. one of them is sticky and one of them is starchy, and so it like makes mm -hmm. it okay. And then you put in like a whole stick of butter mm -hmm. and some cream. And then you just it's whip so it funny. until it's totally smooth. It's, it's so funny because you are the last person that should be talking about like recipes. I know. I I don't really <laughs> like food, but I think I like this just one because one it's recipe. very bland it's and good. beige and smooth. There's no texture. And they're very good. And it's mostly just a buttery flavor. And who doesn't like butter? They're very popular. They're they your are. potatoes. They're always in demand. I always have to make them. They they go they go fast. They do. We can make hand turkeys. Hand turkeys, yes. <laughs> What was that? <laughs> That's my turkey. Oh, you know what that made me think of? Do you remember the year that w one of our daughters was like a year old or something at Thanksgiving and she was like prime chub, you know, oh, with like yeah. the rolls around the wrists and elbows and stuff. And we just, we put a little turkey hat on her and, oh, and yeah. put her in the uh, roasting pan Yep. as if we were going to bake her. Yep. Which we did not do. We did not do. But no. It, oh, and then the next year, not the next year, but when our next kid was about mm -hmm. a year old, I'm still proud of this caption all these years later, took a picture of the two of them together and they were both still, it was like a four-year-old and a one-year-old, right? Like super uh -huh. cute. And they were like in their diapers and stuff. And, and the one-year-old, again, prime chub. And it was our, our turkey and a ham. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> all right. So. Rank. We didn't need our children. We're rank. not cannibals. <laughs> Since we're talking about Thanksgiving, let's rank the fall slash winter holidays. So we got Oy. Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Mm -hmm. Rank them. Well, those are the ones our family celebrates. Other people have other holidays. There's Hanukkah in right. there. Right. Oh, well, yeah. There's... Uh, the ones that we, yeah. we celebrate. Okay. So rank those four from worst to best. Your least favorite to most favorite. <laughs> I... Okay, now at this age, I think New Year's is my least favorite. It used to be my most favorite back when I was in my 20s because it was a lot of fun, but I cannot stay up that late anymore. No, it sucks. So now I hate that <laughs> the one. The kids want to do it. Yeah. It's like, I can't do this. No, and then they're just, you know, monsters the next day because they're so tired. But uh, So it would be New Year's least. I think maybe followed by Thanksgiving just because I'm not like a food person, mm. you know? It's okay. okay. And then uh as a mom, oh, this is gonna be controversial, but I have to say I Christmas is so much work. That yeah. I don't know, that might be my least favorite as a mom. Like yep. that is just so, so much work to make 
all of the magic happen. Yep. So I guess Halloween, that leaves Halloween as number one. Uh, yeah. So mine, uh, I would say New Year's is my least favorite, then emphatically Christmas. Mm, because of all next, the work. Because of all the work. And it's like just just a mess. Just the mess and yeah. the assembling all the things uh, yeah. at like 10 p.m. on Christmas Eve. Absolutely. And, and by, then, and by and that then point, Santa. Your trees, and by that point, your tree's falling apart. All That's like, right. It's, it's like dehydrated. The, yeah, yeah. But then Santa gets all the credit for all the work that we did. Yeah, I think it's time that I hate that guy. I think it's time that we definitely tell the kids that it's been us the whole time so know. we start getting I don't wanna, credit. I don't wanna, like, enough of that jolly old man i know the older one knows but the younger one is still she likes you know. the magic yeah you gotta let them right. have we'll the keep, magic we'll keep, we'll... as long as possible but you better believe we're gonna be milking that once they find out the truth <laughs> look what we've been doing for you yes uh that's, oh, just, that's not even talking about the <laughs> easter bunny the tooth fairy i hope no children are listening to this <laughs> Probably... If someone has their kids with them oh as they're gosh. listening. Absolutely. We probably should have Should have, have had actually... a trigger warning. We need to probably add that. Hey, producers, let's add this. <laughs> Do not listen with children. This, here, I'll say something. This episode uh, talks about the magic of Christmas. In detail. In detail. <laughs> and or brutal maybe should, honesty. Maybe we should just cut out the Santa doesn't exist type of talk completely. Nah. <laughs> the kids need to know. You know what? That's such a weird thing for me because I did not grow up with Santa. Like we just knew that it was a story yeah. and we knew that other people believed it and we were told like don't ruin other people's fun, but we never believed it ourselves. And so to me I've always felt a little bit weird. Mhm. Mm I feel like I'm lying to my children and then they're going to find out that I lied to them and then mm. it's going to be, you know, this horrible yeah. thing. But you had a different experience. You don't feel that way about Santa. No, I I, I believed in Santa till I was, I don't know, eight? Fifteen? Nine. Yeah, still do. <laughs> He's magical. Uh, yeah. All right. We got to get to the episode All right. Here. Let's do it. All right. This is, we could, we could just talk about Santa all day, but uh, let's talk about our guests today. Our exciting guest today is retired army urologist and current podcast host of War Docs. It's a wonderful podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Doug Soderdahl. Dr. Soderdahl is joining us to talk about military medicine uh, and uh, just uh, uh, fascinating stories. You can imagine just all the interesting unusual outrageous things that he's encountered and uh but if you don't want to hear about what people insert into their urethras oh, now yes. is the time yes uh, just to do something else yeah listen to uh, an older episode and uh, <laughs> pass the time or yeah whatever i don't know but you know there is a, a bit of urethra talk mm -hmm. um and so but definitely just so many interesting things to learn about with military medicine a whole different world for us mm -hmm. um and he so spent 38 years yes in the army that's right 30 that's on active duty he's been on deployments um mm -hmm. it also uh humanitarian missions he talks about all this and and the things he's encountered and um it just a fascinating career he's had so yeah Let's get to it. All right. Here is Dr. Doug Soderdahl. Hey, Will, do you know what my favorite December holiday is? Uh, Christmas? Nope. Hanukkah? No. Our anniversary? No. It's Wife and Death live at the Improv. Oh, that is a good holiday. Yeah, we're telling our amazing story live in person. And we have a meet and greet before every show. You can get a photo with us. We can, we'd love to meet you December 9th, 10th, and 11th in Southern California. We'll be at the Improv in Irvine, Ontario, and Oxnard. You can buy tickets and check out dates, glockenflecken.com slash live. We also have a special offer for our Patreon members. That's right. All the Glock flock out there. Free meet and greet with your normal ticket. Just tell us your username and you're in. See you next month. All right, we are here with Dr. Doug Soderdahl. Doug, thank you so much for joining us. It really is a pleasure to have you here. Hey, it's great to be on your show. Um, I, first thing I want to just ask you, so I know that, um, uh, you, you retired, right? I like did. a couple years back, uh, 2021. Yeah. 
So how is your pickleball game these days? Uh, I, I'm telling you what, I, I can do pretty well with pickleball people. I actually have a guy who I play with a lot. He's 83 and uh, he, he goes, okay, Doug, I'm going to, I'm going to cover you this, this game. Okay. I, I got you. <laughs> It's it's see that game is is huge now. There's people all over in our neighborhood playing it. My parents have gotten into it. It's it's uh, they have really like taken off. They have like professional pickleball of uh, like leagues now. Mm, really professional. I I want to say I mean it's on ESPN like at about two o'clock in the morning. So yeah, you know, it, I think it, so. Yeah, it's amazing, and you know it's <laughs> been around for like twenty five years. And I remember really a, a family member. Honestly, 25 years ago, saying, "Oh, you got to do this pickleball thing." I'm like, "That sounds really, really stupid." And here we are. It's on ESPN. I'm watching it at two o'clock in the morning and learning right. all kinds of strategy. Oh, well, are you? You're enjoying retirement? I, I love retirement. Um, I, yeah. I, I didn't know I'd like it as much, but it's been good. I'm very jealous. I've been waiting to retire since I started working. Really, you're only 39 years <laughs> I old. I know, but doesn't it just sound like the life? Yeah. <laughs> You've got a, you've got a ways. Uh, no, none of that talk right now. All right, we got we have a podcast to run here. Okay. That's right. um, so, well, Doug, let's talk a little bit about your career because uh, it's certainly a, a unique one um, as a physician. You uh, you you've been in military medicine your entire career. Is that right? That's right. I originally wanted to be a helicopter pilot in, in the army, and so I went to college, did an ROTC scholarship. I was all set for aviation. And I kind of felt like I like biology. I kind of like what doctors do. My dad's actually a urologist too. And I didn't want to do that. Um, but right at the time when I had to make my decision, there was actually like three or four aviation accidents that happened in military medicine. I said, this is kind of a message probably oh, to wow. me that maybe I should do something different. And so, yeah, uh -huh. I went, I went through medical school, army paid for that. And then, you know, trained in urology and really was 38 years in uniform. So, cause my, my recollection of, you know, starting med school. So when you started med school, did you know you were going to go the military route? Yeah. Yeah. So you, you, you knew, okay. Yeah. In ROTC in college, you basically have to finish college and then you join the army in some branch, you know, infantry, armor, whatever, but they can give you a, you know, a kind of a little waiver to go to medical school because they want to have doctors. And uh, gotcha. they have a scholarship program, actually, that pays for medical school. So instead of coming out $200,000 in debt, I came out debt-free, which was pretty good. Not bad. Yeah. Are you jealous about that? Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, that, that's how you retire I, early. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> I, I remember, you know, starting off med school, there being some, uh, I guess, recruiters or just uh, we we had a, a a a talk by someone in the military talking about military medicine and you know, so if you wanted to go that route, um, and so I, I think most most of our listeners who are in medicine. They know a little bit about like how the match works, about how choosing your specialty works in um, uh, the non-military world, the civilian world, I guess you could say. Um, and so can you give us a, an idea about what it's like kind of from med school going into the military? It's actually very, very similar. Um, okay. you, you apply mostly for an internship, but most of the internships are connected with a residency. Um, at the time I did it, the urology residency wasn't connected. So I applied to do a transitional surgical internship and then applied later for urology. But the match is very much similar. In the military, everybody gets an internship spot. So you train and, you know, when you finish that one year, you actually can be deployed and be on a ship as the ship doctor. I actually went to Korea and was the doc at a, a little small clinic in the middle of South Korea right out of internship, taking care of all kinds of mostly wow. primary care things, but, you know, a lot of young soldiers. So not, not too crazy. Yeah, man. And, um, I know I I've, I've learned a little bit about like the ophthalmology military. There's like, mm -hmm. there's, there's not as many residency programs. They're like military based residency programs. Um, and so you mentioned that you, didn't want to do urology. Is that right? I think you said that. Yeah, I, I didn't want to, you know, when I, when I decided I was going to go to medical school, 
And yeah. I said, I'm not going to do what my dad did. And maybe it's genetic, but I just found, I found out, <laughs> you know, in medical school, it was easy for me to eliminate things that I really didn't sure. want to do. But when I hit, it was for me, it was between urology and orthopedic surgery. And, uh, uh, okay. I, and really what I found was when I did my ER rotations and general surgery residency or general surgery rotations, I didn't see many urologists in the, you know, the ER in the middle of the night, but <laughs> those ortho, the ortho bros were, were always there. So that, that kind of helped me make my decision to be a urologist. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, hold on. You know, who's also not in the emergency room ever well, is I, the ophthalmologist. I, so what's the deal? It's just a different kind of ball, Doug. I, I know. I, I didn't, I didn't get exposed to that ball. Um, but I, I really did want to be the sheriff of ball town, which is, you know, that's, that's the, the true urology thing. <laughs> it's, uh, um, you know, I think it's, it's probably a well-known fact for people in medicine that, uh, urologists have some of the best senses of humor oh, yeah. in all of medicine. You have to, I mean, you have to, you kind of have to, right. I mean, you're, you're dealing with penises all day long <laughs> and, you know, it, it's, it, it is funny. I'll come home and, you know, the conversation will, will take a turn to penises and they're like, I've got four kids. They're like, dad, really leave it at work. Are they sons? I have two, two sons and twin daughters. Okay. Did, did they get tired of all the penis talk? <laughs> I mean, well, when they were younger, I mean, young guys <laughs> love penis talk. So, uh, I, you know, sure. one of the first times, the first time I did my podcast, uh, my son calls me up. He's like, Hey, I listened to your, your episode. I said, I didn't know you could say genitalia so many times in context in, in five minutes. <laughs> so congratulations, <laughs> sir. You're on your way to a stellar podcast career. Oh, funny. <laughs> your Christmas letters must be interesting too, right? Like people talk about how their jobs are going and all of that. Well, I, you know, another funny story about Christmas letters. Um, we actually had friends of ours early in my residency who sent us a Christmas letter and in it, it said, you know, I had a kid by normal vaginal delivery. And I said, that's in a Christmas letter. You can't say vagina in a Christmas letter, can you? And at that point, it was on. So ever since then, it's been 30 years. Every year, I get the word penis in our Christmas letter. And, and, it's, and it's gotten to the point where I have to hide it sometimes so people have to look for it. Uh-huh. So I'll use things like the pen is mightier than the sword so that you can get the, um, you know, boom, mm-hmm. there's the penis. And people will call me or, or email me like, dang it, I got your crystal there. I can't find it. I said, well, it's yeah. backwards. It goes to Agnol. And... <laughs> it's like a, it's a it's word become search. a crossword within, yeah, <laughs> right. a word search, right. Oh, oh my goodness. That would be that's, fun. That's when you know you're putting together a good Christmas yeah. letter. When you got people like, where is the penis in this? <laughs> it, it's, actually, it's actually kind of stressful. You know, I, you, know <laughs> you have to you have to show up each year and, and kind of outdo the year before of how you incorporate penis in there. You know what you should do this year? You should just write your letter in the form of, right? Like have the words in that shape. <laughs> the, 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 have a the lines just, just all it, really make it obvious it just forms for them. a penis yeah like the whole thing's I think a penis a, i can't think of the name of that kind of a poem right where it's in the shape of the thing that it's <laughs> yeah, talking I, about I just, I'm, I'm thinking about explaining that to my mom <laughs> <laughs> what, fair enough what is that shape <laughs> i i love uh how you know because this is what happens in medicine when you're when you're a physician like you're so much of who you are is wrapped up in like your job, right? And what you do. And so it definitely bleeds into other areas of your life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and for you, you shared with us a story uh, about uh, your um, your son in high school uh, and you getting a call uh, about penises. Yeah, you know, it, it, it happened. Unfortunately, it was a kind of stressful time for our family. And uh, my my wife's father had just passed away. And so kids were acting out a little bit and my son is at high school like high schoolers do and he got himself in trouble for drawing penises in the textbook and so at this point since it was kind of stressful in my life this was not something that was going to bother me so the principal calls me up and i'm at work and you know she's just super serious sir um your son has been drawing penises in a textbook. And I'm like, Ooh, I think I just drew two penises this morning. 
because I'm a neurology clinic. Yeah, it's just it was it was one of those just uh, following in his father's footsteps. That's right. <laughs> Maybe I get him to do the Christmas letter since he already knows how. Yeah, to there make you the go. <laughs> oh, I'm sure the principal loved to hear that. Uh, yeah, I mean, she was yeah. she was ready for me just to you know fall into a blob of nothing. Oh my goodness, my son is drawing so, penises. Is it, are they, so sorry. Are they anatomically good? I mean, t- right. tell me about how were they? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. let me see. I'll cr- I'll tell him how to do it right. That's. <laughs> Yeah, you want a real one. Just come on. <laughs> so eventually you settled on urology. Uh, and what what was it that drew you to the field? It, the thing about urology that I really liked was that the patient population is very, very happy because you can do things for them. So if you can help someone pee, help someone stop leaking on themselves, help them get an erection, help them not have cancer – help them stop having pain from a kidney stone. They love that stuff. And so I found yeah. that the patients were, were great. I, I love the patients. And of all the rotations that I went on, I said, that's a pretty happy patient population. I kind of like dealing with them and having relationships with those folks. Yeah. I mean, as a man, if I had a penis problem, like I, I'd be distressed. Oh, you've seen your fair share I, of urologists. I do. I've 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 seen a couple of urologists. With two you know. times having testicular cancer. Yeah, I have. I have definitely have an appreciation for what you do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and you know, seeing your your videos of hey, check your testicles. Um, and it's that's important, right. and, and that's one thing about being in the military is that we deal with a largely young male population, and so that's right in you know yeah. the sweet spot of where you know folks are at risk for for testicular cancer. And so right. we, we want and, to get that out there. And so you've, you've uh, being in the military, you have, you have practiced in, I guess, I, just give me a sense for what it's like to have a 30 year career in military medicine, because you're, you're going to different parts of the world. What are the types of environments? Are you always working in a hospital setting? Um, how is it different overseas from, from your, your practice like stateside? Yeah, I mean, most of my career has been spent stateside. Um, You you move around in the military. So I practiced in Augusta, Georgia, Virginia Beach, San Antonio, Seattle, Tacoma area. But one of the things about military medicine is that there's a lot of opportunities to do things, you know, both in deployments and so going to support war efforts in Iraq and Afghanistan, but also going on humanitarian missions. And so I've had the opportunity to do medicine in middle of nowhere, Korea, in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, in Ghana, all kinds of just fantastic opportunities that as a civilian physician, you may or may not get a chance to do that, especially go to war. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, and you, you shared with us um, some interesting anecdotes, <laughs> very very interesting. And that's the, and you must have the stories for days yeah. just about, about medicine you know, is crazy enough. Then military, you right. know, being in the military always comes with lots of stories. So to combine them, oh my goodness. But also you seem at times to be, to be in situations where maybe you don't have the type of resources, mm. right. That you, that right. you normally would. Um, and you told us a story about uh, um, a, and while you're in Iraq, um, a, a mechanic, who, uh, a contractor mechanic who who came in. Yeah, and that was a, a crazy thing. So in a war zone, you, you can't have consumable alcohol. And and generally, it's, you know, it's not that big of a problem. You just deal with it. But we had this mechanic who apparently was an alcoholic, and he couldn't find you know stuff to get his fix. So he wound up drinking antifreeze and you know, having ethylene glycol poisoning. And so... They bring this guy into our ER in the middle of Iraq, and we have some medicine types and ER docs that are, you know, calculating urine osmolalities and anion gaps and things like that. But what are those? I, I don't nerds. Know. Right. <laughs> nerds. Like, totally nerds. And, you, know, you, you actually kind of have to remember those things, right? But that's, I mean, that's kind of <laughs> kidney, that's kind of nephrologist territory there, even right. for a urologist, and right? And the difference okay. between urology and nephrology is that we don't really have a favorite part of the kidney. I mean, it's not like, <laughs> hey, I'm a loop of Henley guy or, you know, I'm collecting gotcha. duck person. So this guy's in the ER and he's not doing well. And they're trying to figure out what to do with them because normally you'd give them IV alcohol. This was the treatment back in the day. I know we've got some newer treatments now. But we didn't have that. 
And so IV uh, alcohol. Yeah, what is that for? I'm not in medicine, so, yeah, so I don't know. So know. ethylene glycol breaks down by the body um, and forms poisons that, that wind up you know, killing your organs. And so what alcohol does is it competes with the ethylene glycol for these receptors and keeps those things from breaking it down into the poison. And so you want to okay. keep those receptors busy with something besides ethylene glycol. So right. these guys in the ER are trying to figure out, well, who, what are we going to keep it busy with? We're in the middle of a war zone. How do we get it into them? We don't have alcohol. We don't have hemodialysis. This guy's going to die. And it just so happened I had talked with my wife a couple of days before. And you know, we always joke about those Dateline shows because it's always the spouse. You know, We always know it's the spouse. And he's like, she said, hey, I watched this <laughs> Dateline thing. And this yeah. the spouse killed her husband by giving him an alcohol enema. And because he had esophageal cancer and she just poisoned him with alcohol. And somehow this thing pops into my mind as I'm walking through the ER in Iraq. And I'm like, why don't you just put some alcohol in his butt? And they look at me like, dude, we're calculating the, you know, osmolar gap here. And you're talking about that. But they thought about it for a second. They're like, Hey, we, you know, maybe we could get alcohol into him, either the NG tube and, and, and see if we could do it that way. But how do we get alcohol? And I'm like, why don't you call, right. call the MPs? You know, maybe they have like a confiscation you know, center of alcohol that you know, comes in bootlegged into Iraq. And holy crap. I mean, they show up with, you know, top line, you know, Johnny Walker, Blue, McAllen. <laughs> Blanton's, Pappy, all, all kinds of like, wow, this is, you know, I had a really nice bar. And then, Wait, where exactly, where exactly were you at this time? I was, I was in Mosul. So, so Northern okay. kind of Northern part of Iraq. And, and so and you this know, is, this is the military, like a, the a U.S. military base, I'm guessing. Right. Right. So it's a, it's a FOB. So forward operating base. And, okay. you know, we, we just, you know, we're kind of, we're, we're all, kind of protected in our little enclave there, but everything outside is dangerous. So you can't go to the, you know, Iraqi 7-Eleven and and pick up (laughs) a six pack of something. And so MPs show up with, you know, all this awesome alcohol (laughs) and and they start trying to put it through the NG tube and it's just not working. And I'm like, really? Dude, put it in his butt. It it works. It it killed this guy on Dateline. It's going to (laughs) work. And and so they're like, how do we do that? And I'm like, I don't know who came up with it. We're like, well, let's just do an endotracheal tube and, and just put it in that way. And they wound up like, and this is the most surreal thing. You're in the middle of Iraq and they're pouring Johnny Walker blue into an endotracheal tube that's going into someone's rectum. But the guy, I mean, he survives. He, he absorbs the alcohol. It gets to the level that they wow. need to. And we got him on an aircraft and got him to Germany where he could get hemodialysis and I mean, it's just amazing what you have to do sometimes to innovate when you don't have what you have in, in you know your normal daily practice. Please, Funny that that hasn't caught on. Please tell me, yeah, please tell me that was uh, you wrote that up and uh, published it somewhere. <laughs> I'm a urologist, you know. I'm, 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 I'm not going to take credit for that one. That's right. Yeah, Dateline gets credit for that one. That's yeah, right. apparently. <laughs> By the way, you totally strike me as a Lupa Finley man. No way. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Lupa Henley is yeah. way overrated. A gl- I'm a glomerulus guy. <laughs> You're a glomerulus guy. All right. I'll, I'll accept that. <laughs> um, uh, and, and so, wow, that's that's incredible. And you, yeah. I know you mentioned Honduras earlier, right? Was that that was uh, you did a human, humanitarian mission there? Yeah, Is we, that one we, of the we do kind of medical training exercises and wind up going to the you know the capital city of Honduras, Tegucigalpa, and working in their hospital, Escuela, so their public hospital, and. What we want to do is kind of get used to operating environments that are not perfect. I mean, the operating rooms there, honestly, gotcha. you know, there were birds flying in and landing, you know, on the back table. That, that that's oh, kind of wow. how crazy it is. But we're like, hey, antibiotics that works. But um, yeah. we would we would see patients and they would know that we were coming. And I don't know why, but something in Tegucigalpa you could almost have a stamper for the, the history. You know, a young man was walking across the street, was hit by a bus and broke his pelvis and now has a urethral stricture 
can't pee and has a tube sticking out of his abdomen that's you know basically draining the urine from his bladder not normally yes. and so these guys have to potentially live with that tube from 18 to whenever they pass away and so as urologists that's one of the things that we do is a kind of a complex surgery to reconstruct the the urethra and the honduran surgeons really didn't like doing it because it has a lot of complications. So we would go there mm. and do a lot of urethroplasties and, and kind of fix these young people's urethras and give them a new lot in life. And, and I'll never forget this one guy because they, they come in at the beginning. It's a two week, two and a half week mission. And they just come in mass because they know that we're coming. And we basically just see everybody and then sign them up for surgery. Okay, Monday's full, Tuesday full, Thursday full, whatever. So we had our surgery schedule completely full. And we see this young guy, and you know, just a he's got the sorrow, the sorrowful case of urethral stricture. And he's like, oh, can I get on the schedule? I hate this. And we're like, well, you can show up and, and see what happens. Maybe, maybe we'll get you in. He was there every single day of the mission. And then finally on the last day of the mission, there was a case that we were going to do and the guy came in and had eaten, eaten a full breakfast and we're like, man, we're not going to you know, take the risk and do you, what, what, what can we do? And this guy is, is this huge long bench in this hospital, all these people, masses of humanity He's sitting on the end of the bench. I'm like, why don't you go call that guy and see if he wants to do it. And so we went to him and said, Hey, did you eat breakfast? Nope. And he's like, you want to do your surgery? And I mean, it was like, he had just won the Super Bowl. He he yeah. like, is running down, high fiving everybody down this <laughs> row, and just the happiest person on the planet to get this tube out that he would have to live with. And so, you know, those kind of things you learn to innovate and you learn to do things when you don't have the full suite of everything that you have. And that's good for military surgeons to be able to to do that and think on your feet and be able to mm-hmm. practice in you know less than great. Yeah. Environments. I mean, I, I get, I get annoyed whenever I don't have the right eye drops in clinic. I can't mm-hmm. imagine. Yeah. <laughs> like being, yeah. I mean, you're right. You know, you gotta, um, I guess you have to be able to adapt and that's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. Now, and, and when you go to these places, are, are most of the types of like surgical subspecialties, uh, physician, you know, specialties, are they represented well, or are you, do you find yourself kind of extending your range of, of outside of your scope a little bit, just out of necessity? Yeah. For, for deployments, you know, when we go to Honduras or go to Ghana on these medical missions, you know, kind of medical readiness training exercises, we're there just to do urology, just like ophthalmology would go and do cataracts or whatever. And that's all they would do. Mm-hmm. But when I get deployed to Iraq, I'm basically a surgeon, a, a surgeon extender. And so if you know someone comes in, <clears throat> gunshot went to the liver, you know, I'm operating on the liver, I'm operating on the heart, and I'm putting external fis- fixators on patients with you know broken bones. And the orthopedic surgeons, you know, they may be busy doing some complex, you know, major orthopedic surgery on the other table. We had actually two operating tables in the same operating room. So you could, you know, 10 feet away, you could say, hey, you know, dude, am I doing this right? And you're like, you're a urologist. You like to get things straight. You can make that leg straight. And so I got to be actually pretty good at putting those external fixators on um, and, and making nice. the bone straight. Hey, you got to be an orthopedic surgeon after all, yeah. just for a little bit. I mean, yeah, we, we did a lot of ortho. So yeah, I, I love your ortho I character. I can, I can be that bro. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> I need to work on my urologist character though. I've only, mm-hmm. I've only done a, a, a couple different. I'm a little skits. surprised. Yeah. That you haven't run with that one a well, little bit more. It's almost like, like too easy in a lot of ways, it, it, it you is. know, like, the jokes just they write themselves it's uh i i could probably get you to help me out actually with i mean i'm just hearing these stories is 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 really good i'm always trying to kind of come up with something yeah i mean do, doing my you know my my due diligence research for coming on your show i said i'm, I'm gonna search for a urology thing it was yeah. you know, sticking things and in, in urethras and yeah monopoly pieces are okay but you know <laughs> I, I took, we took care of a guy who put one of those chunky Sharpies, you know, the, the big ones. I don't know how he got it in there. 
Oh but, my. Oh yeah, gosh. I mean, okay. But it didn't come out the way it came in. And uh, yeah. so we had to operate on that. Was that also in a war zone? That was not in a war zone. <laughs> that, you know, my yeah. goodness. I don't think chunky I, sharpies I, were allowed. Just why? The, uh, the, the, it's a thing, uh, you yeah. know, of, uh, you know, if, if, I guess for men, you know, if there's I just, all... are you not worried about hurting yourself? To me, that seems like the, the first I thing I'll, that I'll, I might I'll think you, about. I'll give you a quick example of, of someone, we kind of figured out why he was doing it. And he wound up having or the, you know, the dog chains that the military people wore. They have this little kind of beaded necklaces that they put it on. So he would kind of put the bead thing into his urethra and then mm. just rip it out. And that, you know, ah! that, you know, somehow was <laughs> pleasing to him. Um, but, but one day he uh, fed it in a little bit and it disappeared. And so he figured, Hey, you know, I don't see it anymore. It's probably gone. You know, probably just dissolved in there. And, you know, mm. <laughs> six months later, he's got this gigantic bladder stone, you know, that is formed around this chain that's sitting in his bladder. Oh my gosh. I might pass out. <laughs> a little fade that's um uh, how you guys do this <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um i i don't know because i don't think i could do that that's I, I mean people think eyeballs are gross but that's that's that sounds difficult to deal with See, it's just the like the the vicarious pain that yeah is difficult like, to feeling, like yeah Oof. it's like almost like you can relate a little bit too much to something like that when yeah. you when you have a, a penis of your own, yeah. And, and one of the things too that I used to you know talk to medical students that would rotate on our service, trying to figure out what they wanted to do, especially if they wanted to do surgery. You know, yeah. I, I would say, okay, you know, think about what body fluids the surgeons deal with of the specialties. Mm -hmm. You know, ENT, you have to deal with snot all day. Ugh. You know, yeah. the general surgeons, you got pus and poop. You know, mm -hmm. urine is sterile and. The one thing they would always come up was like, well, ophthalmology has tears, and that's uh, I could I could sit in a barrel mm -hmm. of tears, that'd be okay. Well, that's there. No, it doesn't count. Be a urologist. Yeah. <laughs> how is how how's your success rate on uh, convincing students they should go into urology? I'd say you know it, it used to be urology was a required rotation. Now it seems like people don't rotate on urology. So the, oh, I never did a urology. Right. So, I, so the people never. who do kind of already are interested a little bit so they're they're not as hard of a you know a, a win yeah but when everyone yeah. used to say hey you, you know you do a surgery rotation you go rotate through ortho you do a bit of ent you do some urology maybe some ophthalmology yeah you know, that was more difficult when you had you know those days yeah yeah what uh, what did whenever the students would come on or res like did you did you let them name the team because I know you've come up with some really pretty good names for the for the urology team. Yeah, they, they would they would come in there and, and think that they had come up with something new that you know the urologists had never heard before in the you know thirty years we've been doing this. So, <laughs> oh hey, we're part of the stream team. Like ooh, we never heard that one before. <laughs> you know, we're we're on the rod squad. We're <laughs> We're the boner owners, <laughs> the dick ducks. Yeah, you, know, you can go on and on and on. I, yeah, it, it would be hard for me to come, you know, come up with or have someone come up with a name, a euphemism that I haven't heard about. You've what, heard it all by uh, by this point. I, I think so. And, and if I hear something new, I'll put it in my Christmas letter. I guarantee you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I want to ask you, what is what sticks in your mind as? the most challenging place that you have practiced medicine? Uh, I would say, you know, in deployment is, is a very challenging place because you, you really are dealing with a demand that outweighs the supply. And one of the things that I had a chance to do in deployment was to be the, the guy who was in charge of triage. And so I was the first licensed surgeon to evaluate people coming off helicopters, coming, you know, off striker vehicles, ambulances, units were dropping people off and in a big, huge firefight. And, you know, you get 30, 40, 50 of these people coming in from all directions and they would all funnel through me. And I had to make the decision. It's this person get one of our, you know, we had four OR tables. So 
if you're going to go immediately to surgery, I'm keeping track of how many beds we have available. Can this be delayed? You know, is this mm. minimal? Are they, you know, they have a sprained ankle or, you know, something that we could see in clinic later or, and this was the hardest thing for me was making the decision that somebody was expecting. And, you know, if that person showed up to an emergency room, I live in San Antonio, they would do everything they can. They would throw the kitchen sink to try and save that person. Right. I'd look at that person and say, we don't have what it takes to, to take care of you. And we're just going to try and make you comfortable. And, and that was something that was very hard for me. And sometimes after a long or a big mass casualty event, you know, you go back after those people who were coming out of the OR and you look at the other categories. And there was actually people in the expectant category that wound up living somehow. And I was like, man, I, I was the guy who put them there and, and here they wind up living. It just, that was probably the most difficult situation. Um, the hardest from you just kind of expanding my scope of things was after I finished my internship and I'm the doc in this post in Korea and you know, mm -hmm. I, I'm it. So I'm hoping someone doesn't come in with a heart attack or, you know, please have a rash yeah. or something. <laughs> yeah. don't, 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 don't give me something. Oh, like you're, you're like the only I mean, doc? I, I'm with another intern graduate. Yeah. Oh, wow. Jeez. And, and, That's and so, a lot of you know, pressure. Yeah, we, <laughs> we can we can call the helicopter to bring them to the big hospital in Seoul, but you know, if someone comes in pulseless or whatever. Hey, yeah. you're, you're it, man. Right. Wow. I mean, you. That's that's like the best on the job training you could possibly get, right? I mean, you're having to deal with with anything, even eye problems. I'm sure. Did you get some eye problems in there? Yeah, yeah, I did. did you... And it's it, eye that. stuff is not easy. I, I that was one of the reasons I couldn't do ophthalmology. It's just I, I couldn't. It's too tiny. It, it reminded me of like looking at a little kid's ear. You know, every time I looked in, you know, <laughs> pediatrics in the ear, I'm like, they need antibiotics because I can't see anything. That, that was kind of ophthalmology for me. It's, it's just so tiny that I don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, based on what you've already told us that you know how to do, I think you could have handled it, doctor. I think you would have been just fine. It seems like in the military, there might be like a disproportionate amount of open globes, though. Like what kind of eye stuff did you see? Yeah. I in, mean, in, in deployment, yeah. that was a that was a, a big uh, you know, one of the things that they saw a lot of, and yeah, we, we actually did uh, a recent episode of uh, an ophthalmologist who was an army ophthalmologist who was there early in the war and just had an amazing experience saving eyesight of, you know, a lot of patients with really bad traumatic injuries that mm. you, you just don't see. That, that's another thing. You don't see anything like what you see in a war yeah. zone in the ER here. I mean, we don't have IEDs. We don't have big bombs blowing up and, you know, mm. high velocity weapon injuries. And, and they're just, they're different. It, it, it's a different beast out there. How far into your career uh, before you were in an active war zone on a deployment? Uh, let's see. My first deployment was in 2005. And I graduated from residency in 1997. So I had some, some time in. And kind of the ironic thing was, was that the year before I was deployed, I completed a fellowship in minimally invasive surgery. So you know, doing laparoscopic prostatectomies and things like that. And then, okay, I got all these laparoscopic skills. And I'm like, okay, you got to go take care of an open globe and you know, people who need... Everything's open, right? It's all open. Yeah, I mean, everything is open. Yeah. And that's the thing that's kind of scary to me these days is that when I trained in urology, we would do a lot of, you know, radical retropubic prostatectomies. And if you walked into that surgery in the days when I was training, you really couldn't tell if that person had been shot in the pelvis or they were actually doing, you know, radical prostatectomy because there's just so much blood. It's just crazy stuff. Yeah. And nowadays, at least the residents that I, you know, help train, uh, they're doing all of their radical prostate surgeries with the robot. And so they're sitting there in their mm. socks and, you know, they're not even scrubbed in and everything is 10 time magnification. Nothing bleeds. It's great for the patient. I mean, it's fantastic. I, if I needed a prostate surgery, I definitely would go with a robot, but there's not a robot, you know, in right. Iraq. There's not one in, 
you know, most places in the world, I'm in, sure. In, Ga right. in Gaza or Israel yeah. or right. Ukraine. And, and those are the things that we're preparing for that next kind of large scale combat operation. And we need to have people yeah. who are familiar with, hey, everything is open. I don't, I didn't do this in my residency. I don't do this in my practice. How do we do that? And, and that's what kind of keeps me oh, up yeah. at night. And you know, the people on our podcast, I always ask them, you know, how can we sh make sure that we're ready to do that? Because back in the day, you know, a urologist trained as a general surgeon kind of starting off and then you kind of branched into urology and you did everything. Mm -hmm. You know, now I call it the, the left nut phenomenon. Where, you know, if you got a left testicular problem, you go to the left testicle specialist. You know, <laughs> right, if it's right. on the right side, oh, no, we, we got to mm. consult the right nut guy. And so it's just so specialized that, yeah, you know, if, those, if, the, if a left nut guy had to put on an external fixator, I'm not sure if they could do it today. No, right. I mean, I can barely operate on right eyes. I'm, I'm a left You're eye. You're a left you know. eye guy. We we do we haven't gotten that bad in ophthalmology, but we do have seven subspecialties in ophthalmology. So I totally uh, you know get what you're saying. It's uh, yeah. it's yeah. we're becoming. That's not me. I'm glaucoma. No, I'm I'm, I'm corny. <laughs> yeah. I'm corny. Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love I I love surrounding myself with all these different subspecialists who are smarter than me in different areas of medicine. But when you look at it like objectively, it it, it seems it seems absurd to have so many people specializing in, in just these, right, but, but it's great for areas. the patients. I mean, you know, if you, yeah, if, oh, absolutely. If you, absolutely. if you have somebody with narrow angle glaucoma and you've got a narrow angle glaucoma guy and who does yeah. it all day long, like, Hey, that, that's who I want to go to. I don't want to see. That's the problem. That's the problem with me choosing the name Dr. Glockenflecken because everybody assumes I'm a glaucoma specialist, but I am not. Mm. <laughs> uh, so that's that's my burden that I have oh, to bear. Oh, poor baby. <laughs> so so how, how did you come up with the name? Oh, it's an it's an actual term in ophthalmology. It, it's uh, I he was just tried to think of the most ridiculous ophthalmology term that he could, and that's what he landed on. Fortunately, there's a lot of there were a lot of things to choose from, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I went with a. Uh, it's just a it, it's a exam. Just sounds finding. funny. Yeah, it Which just his sounds funny. I mean, we have nothing. We have a, like a German thing in urology called Steinstrasse. So after, you know, so, so, so lithotripsy, so if you do external lithotripsy, break up stones in the kidney and they go into the smaller stones and they'd all kind of funnel into the ureter and line up like a stone street. Oh. And so they had to, there you, you know, go. stone street didn't sound as cool as Stein. Strasse. So, so what I'm hearing is we could do a joint podcast, Dr. Glockenflecken and Dr. Steinstrasse. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we could call it just all about balls. It's just balls. Or just balls, just balls. just balls. That's it. That's the name of the podcast. Yeah. There, there you go. go. And the creative juices are flowing right now. Mm -hmm. But let's take a break, and uh, we'll be right back. Hey, Kristen. Yeah. Do I look like a cardiologist when I hold this? You look like you're trying to be a cardiologist. Oh, because I'm an ophthalmologist. Well, and just like, what are you even doing with your hands <laughs> there? I I do. I feel like a cardiologist. Yeah. Though. And that's the most important thing because of the stethoscope. Yeah. This it is, is so the, cool. the tool of the trade. It's an Echo Core 500 digital stethoscope with three lead ECG. It even makes an ophthalmologist feel like a cardiologist. That's saying something. Right? And it's got 40 times noise amplification, mm -hmm. noise cancellation, right. three audio filter modes, and a full color display. Yeah, it's bananas. It's, 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 uh, what stethoscope has all of that? I know. We Nothing. live in the future. No, just the Echo Core 500. That's right. That's it. Uh, and you can also record. Review, save, share, yeah, and all the things you're listening to. That's right. It's, it's, it's great for teaching. It's great for for just learning yourself. And also, we have a special offer for our U.S. listeners. Visit EchoHealth.com/kkh and use code NOC50 to experience Echo's Core 500 digital stethoscope technology. That's E K O Health slash KKH and use NOC50 to get a 75 day risk free trial and a free case and free shipping with this exclusive offer. All right, we are back with Dr. Doug Soderdahl. And uh, doctor, uh, we're going to play a little game here. Um, now, I don't know how familiar you are with um, the Patriot Store. 
which let me just tell you because I because I understand you told me you don't spend a you haven't spent a lot of time in the VA system you know practicing that's not where you practice but a lot of medical education and training is done at the VA in the VA system these days and there's this fascinating place in the VA I think pretty much any VA hospital has one of these it's called the Patriot Store okay. The Patriot Store, have you, you've seen like a hospital gift shop, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They have kind of interesting things in there, right? Right. Like things like, it's like ceramic turtles mm -hmm. and like giant stuffed giraffes and like, it's all kind of, it's, it's very fascinating what you can find in a hospital. Right. Everything you hospital, need in a hospital. Everything you could. Yeah. Exactly. Well, the Patriot Store at the VA is like the... Uh, it, it's like a, a, a hospital gift shop on steroids. Okay. It's it's this it hospital uh, general store. It's a hospital general store. It's amazing. So here's the game we're gonna play. I'm gonna get, tell you a thing, and you have to guess: Does the Patriot Store at the VA sell that thing? Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. So I, I mean, I, I'll, I will admit now that I'm retired. I have VA yes. benefits, and I do go to the VA. So I'll, okay. I'll be able to check this out. Check out yes. the Patriot store at the VA. All right. I will. Those of you, people, people will know what I'm talking about, even though you two don't really, but that's okay. That's all right. All right. This, these are, these are things. Some of them I made up. Some of them you can actually find in the VA hospital at the convenience store, the Patriot store. Okay. Here we okay. go. All right. Start, Kristen, we'll start with you. Okay. Sunglasses. Yeah. They'd be there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. All right, Doug. Underwear. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can find you can find underwear at the at the Patriot store. All right. <clears throat> Bottled water. Yes. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Of course. These yeah, are too yeah. easy. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, a ghillie suit. A what now? Like a re like a real one or a, a real a real ghillie suit. What is a ghillie suit? It's, Doug, do you want to tell Kristen what a ghillie suit is? Yeah, it, it's a it's a camouflage for you know snipers that they'll they'll wear. Okay. It looks like you're part of the environment. Yeah, it, it, okay. but they're huge. You look like the abdominal snowman or Bigfoot or something like that. Right. So I would say, yeah, sure. Why why wouldn't they have that? Because you may need yes. to hide. Yeah, in a ghillie suit from somewhere. your doctor. From your doctor. It's primarily for <laughs> ophthalmologists who have to walk through the emergency department oh, on their way to the. Sure. Uh, uh, but yes, actually, yes, the VA, the Patriot Store, does have ghillie suits. All right. By the way, I verified all of this with people that I know who work in a VA system, so I'm not lying about any of this stuff. So I think you may have <laughs> broke a secret for ophthalmologists and how they hide in the hospital. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. No one can see us. Right. We're that's wearing a ghillie suit. That's what I'm all right. It's. Exactly. I, you know, it's I we, we're rarely there anyway. I so that was matter. a plant. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, Kristen. Here's one. A pizza oven. Why not? Sure. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Actually, they do. They sell pizza ovens. Okay. At the in at case the, you get hungry while store. you're waiting in <laughs> the, the waiting VA. room. Exactly. All right. There are some long wait times, so Absolutely. you know, yeah. makes sense. And, and, and pizzas, that's when you want pizza, you want a pizza oven, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. right. That's the best kind. All right. All right, Doug. How about a smart car? Like a full-size smart car? Well, they're or, small, but they're, yeah, they're yeah, cars. But yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah, why not? What, you... No, no, yeah. I made that up. <laughs> Come on. I made that up. You sure? <laughs> You, There's not you, enough space. You, they have to fit all the ghillie suits in there, Doug. They can't small. fit a smart car. They, I was thinking it's like when you go to the Tesla store and there's not actually cars there, right? Like you're ordering one. I was like, okay, sure, maybe. Okay, well, if, I mean, if anybody has ever purchased a smart car or any kind of car at a at a Patriot store, please let us know. Send us an email. I suspect. No, I, I was suspect, I suspect they're parked under the ghillie suits. Oh, <laughs> right. Uh, possibly. Um, okay, Kristen. Okay. A drone. Yeah. <laughs> yes, of wait, wait. course. What kind of drone? Like of a course. military drone or like a photography drone? Because that's what I was thinking of. <laughs> like, like, like a drone just, with high, high explosive drones. weaponry? Right. And, or and, just and like missiles? the kind you can fly around your backyard. <laughs> so I, I think they're like for, you know, just leisure drones leisure drone then yes. yeah <laughs> then yes i would say yes absolutely yeah. in fact that one is from personal experience uh my my mentor dr oding yes uh it was after we had um 
just operated and we were at the Patriot store to get some snacks and he also had to buy a, a birthday gift for somebody and he came out with a drone. Of course he so did. So there you go. Yeah. They have drones there. Not a ghillie right. suit. All right, well, <laughs> he did not buy a ghillie suit. Um, he already has one of those. He was right. an ophthalmologist. That's his VR outfit. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Here's here's one that, uh, uh, I mean, okay, we'll, we'll just I'll just ask you. Doug, how about a pogo stick? <laughs> I would say no on the pogo stick. That, that's, that seems like a fall risk item. You would think so, but yes, they do sell pogo sticks at the hmm. Patriot store. For all My the question children is, that are at the VA? Who what? is buying a pogo stick? <laughs> yeah. Because um, I, I don't know if, if people are aware, but it's, it's mostly people who are, you know, a little bit older that, that are, you know, patients at the VA, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, and it, 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 it seems like a great way to break a hip. That's all I'm saying. Well, maybe it's because it's targeted to the older people because the young people may not even know what a pogo stick is. So this way you keep them around to the next generation. That's true. true. Or maybe it's like Dr. Oding. Maybe it's for, for buying a gift Do you for know your what a pogo grandchildren. Stick is? Yes, I know what a pogo stick is. I had a pogo stick. Did you ever have a pogo stick? I did, Doug? for sure. I mean, maybe oh, yeah. Ortho puts them in there. Oh, yeah. There you uh, go. It's, it's, Drum they up they some business. It. That's right. <laughs> uh, th isn't that... It's kind of, I've been thinking about ever since I learned about the pogo sticks at the Patriot store. I've been thinking mm. like, like how amazing it is that like I would spend hours on a pogo stick. Like that was the entertainment. Mm -hmm. Like what would our kids do with a pogo stick? Right I'm now? sure they would still love to use a pogo stick. You think so? Oh, yeah. I think they'd get bored with it faster. I don't know because it's hard to have. learn. you got to have a lot There's of balance. so many other things to do now. I don't know. Yes. I don't know. Anyway. Maybe, maybe if you like put it in a virtual reality environment and you jump on the pogo stick, but you're on the moon or something. There you go. Oh, Please yeah. tell me you've never seen a pogo stick in a urethra. <laughs> That's a little much. Yes. All right. <laughs> All only, right. only, There's, only some guy in the Patriot store, I believe, had one in his urethra. But yeah. I, I, <laughs> There's limits all right, to what the urethra can handle, Kristen. I don't know. Some of these stories. All right. Last one for Kristen. Okay. All right. A thousand piece puzzle. Well, yeah. Nope. They only go up to 500. Oh. That's it. <laughs> that is the pay. Everybody check out. If you find yourself in the VA, go check out the Patriot store. It really is a absolutely fascinating place. Yeah. It's, it's, it kind of reminds me of the like Vermont general stores that they just it, have it really is. all yes. sorts of things in there. So Doug, and, and, if you, and the other thing is, is that the, the your urethral capacity is only 500 puzzle pieces. And so you, you, oh. you, you, a thousand piece set would not make sense. It'd be too many. Too, many. too much. Yeah. Way that would many. be a, a it depends on the urethra. group activity. <laughs> I didn't even, that wasn't even, I, I wrote down, there there's some other things too. You know, you can find pickleball paddles there. Of course. You can find a, an electric bike, uh, oh, big wow. screen TVs. Yeah. They're selling them there? Yeah. How big is this place? Of, uh, you know, they can fit a lot in there. You All just, right. you know. Uh, I'll tell you, next time at the VA, I'm looking for the Patriot yeah, store. Yeah, check it out. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Report was, back. What's in there? <laughs> that was that, and that was our game called "What's in the Patriot Store," which I just <laughs> made that name up. That's anyway. Um, all right, before we go, Doug, I want you to definitely tell us about your the podcast War Docs because I think it's such a fantastic idea. So tell us uh, a little bit about it and you know what the what you're trying to accomplish with this this podcast. Yeah, and it, it kind of came to me very in a strange way. The the last job I had in the military was I worked for our medical corps chief, and so it's a, a you know a general who's in charge of five thousand plus people who are doctors in the army. And so one of the things that that she wanted me to do is communicate with them. And so I would do a lot of speaking and lectures and I was on social media, trying to keep them going, you know, Hey, this is what's going on in, in military medical corps. And I had these two guys, both of them are vascular surgeons, um, Wayne Causey and Kevin Neary come up to me and goes, Hey, you know, this is, we're finding out more stuff that we never knew about military medicine, like strategy and things that what other people do, you should consider doing a podcast. Because Kevin, he was very involved with a couple podcasts, Behind the Knife for Surgery, Audible Bleeding for Vascular Surgery. And I'm like, I have no experience with that. And so that's how it, kind of that conversation started. And I was looking for something different after retiring. 
Um, you know, I just, I kind of have been there, done that with the practice and I was going to do something new. And so instead of kind of focusing just on army doctors, we said, would it be cool? Because everybody, you know, one of the things about being in the military around the military for 38 years is there's so many stories. There's so many good stories. Mm -hmm. How, how can we tell those and, and really get them out there? And so we decided to start this podcast and really the way I try to remember it is HPI and I, for, for ophthalmologists, I'll explain what that is. History of present illness. <laughs> I, I know you guys do, but you know, it's, Barely. Yeah, it, it's, it's honoring the legacy of the folks who are in military medicine, preserving the history. And so kind of what they've done and then inspiring inform uh, and trying to improve it. So that's really what we're trying to do. And we talk to people from all parts of the team. So we talked to medics, corpsmen, PAs, PT, nurses, doctors, dentists, administrators, everybody who's part of that military medicine team and find out, you know, what they've learned, lessons learned from, you know, being in conflicts, being in training exercises all over the globe. <clears throat> One of the, the quotes I often say on the, the podcast is, is Aldous Huxley's quote where, you know, the main lesson of history is that man doesn't learn the lessons of history. Mm. And, and so really want to try and preserve that um, in, in a way that is accessible to a, a younger generation who you yeah. may not see it any other way, but they'll listen to a podcast. Absolutely. Right. That's a, I think it's a great idea and uh, it's wonderful work you're doing. So again, that's, that's war docs. It's a military medicine podcast. Uh, and uh, you also have a website, wardocspodcast.com, so you can check that out. Also, Instagram, right? You're on, the, you're, you're on there, so if you want to see clips and learn more a little bit about it, um, Instagram, at wardocspodcast. Yeah, we're, we're trying. You know, when, there you go. When I started the job as, as being the guy on social media for, uh, you know, for the Army Medicine or Medical Corps, I had one whole friend on, on Facebook and, and that was my wife and she made me <laughs> and, and I'm not a big social media guy. I still only have one friend on Facebook and that, that is, that is my wife. Oh, that's, that's, that, that's, that's, if that's there's the best. going to be one to exactly. have. Exactly. Yeah. Are you, are you friends with me on Facebook? Oh, yeah. I yeah. think we've been friends. This is telling, but I think we've been friends on Facebook for, um, if I had to guess, it'd be like 17 years. Since yeah, before we, because Facebook got started when we were in college. Yeah. Right. Yep. So that was back whenever you would like write whole, like uh, right blog on your wall on yeah. people's. We're <laughs> showing. Like you, we're showing our age. I know. Too. It was all, anyway, let's let's stop <laughs> reminiscing about the good old days of Facebook. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I anyway, trained, I trained I, before there was computers. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what? yeah. See, for me, I, you know, I have yeah. four kids and you know, two of them are married. So I have six critics of everything that I do on, on social media. And, and so mm -hmm. they, they, yeah. they are um, actually good. One of my daughter in laws, uh, she's a, a Kristen with the K and the I's. And so oh, just, she good. spells it correctly. Yeah, yeah. spelled correctly. <laughs> uh, yeah, so she's, she's giving me some tips. And, uh, All okay. right. Yeah, I was going to say you need to put them to work then. If you've got, Definitely. it sounds like you have six possible employees at your fingers. Absolutely. Or volunteers. <laughs> build, build up your War Docs empire. Right. That's right. You're there. But, but I, and I'm also you know, promoting your show, you know, because I have three of them are in the healthcare field. One that does medical device sales. He lives in Houston. He's married. Mm -hmm. And had one of our grandkids. Um, and then one is in PT school and one is a, a PA school. And so oh, wow. when they call me up, they're like, hey, I'm meeting with a neurologist. What should I expect? I'm like, <laughs> let me tell you. Have I got some videos for you to watch? Like, Does their hair really look like that? I'm like, yep. <laughs> and they come back and they go, oh my God, that was exactly what they like. <laughs> Good. I'm glad. Well, uh, Doug, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us and, uh, keep up the great work. Keep, keep going with that podcast. How long have you been doing it now? Uh, a couple of years. Uh, so, a couple of years. Yeah, awesome. So two years. Right. Got more, more, uh, episodes under his belt than we do. So, That's right. you know, we should be taking advice taking from notes, you. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, keep up the great work. And again, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Yeah. Great talking to you guys. All right, let's take a look at some of our favorite medical stories that were sent in by you, the listeners. Um, today, 
we actually don't have a story. We have some puns <gasps> just for Yay! you, Kristen. Are they good ones? I love a good pun. Oof, I'm sure they're fantastic. All right. So our, our this comes from a farmer. <laughs> okay. A farmer. Did you hear about the guy whose whole left side was cut off? No. He's all right now. <laughs> Get it? All mm-hmm. He's all right. Because mm-hmm. no left. I tried playing hide and seek in the hospital, but they kept finding me in the ICU. <laughs> but um. <tsh. laughs> and finally, a patient said to the doctor, I keep dreaming my eye color changed. The doctor says, it's just a pigment of your imagination. Oh, I get it. I get it. <laughs> what is your best eye pun that you've heard or that you tell? Because you have to tell a lot of dad uh, jokes I have, in clinic. I have told people to stop making a spectacle of themselves. Mm, mm-hmm. I bet they like that one. Yeah, they do. They love it. Uh, I, you know, sometimes I, even I have to. You know, resort to puns. Resort to puns. Mm-hmm. Um, My favorite kind are when you don't see them coming, though. Those are the best. Yep, those are good. I guess <laughs> you are just not a pun. I guy. don't know. I don't know what it is. I just have a, like a. You don't like a little wordplay. I'm I'm not a big wordplay guy. I don't, I feel mm-hmm. like I just like because I can't. I don't come up with wordplay. Like I think you have to be super smart to like. Oh, is that what it is? That. You do, and I'm you, not smart enough. Puns make you feel dumb. They do. I think <laughs> puns do kind of make me feel dumb. Not that I don't get them, but I, I can't come up with them. Yeah. I, I just can't do it. Right. I don't know. Hmm. So. Well, we can't all be. <laughs> you know. You're yeah. Your whole family. They're all. You're all puns. Oh, we people. love wordplay. Yes. Yeah, it's you're all about it. So. Yeah. It um. So you just feel inferior. Mm. Well, it's, it's an inferiority complex. We could dig into this. Send us your stories, <laughs> knock knock high at human content.com. Thank you, a farmer, for those. <laughs> um, and what a fascinating guest we had yeah, today. Yeah, super interesting. Not a not a world that we are particularly familiar with. So it was really interesting to hear some of his stories. Not familiar with it at all. Yeah. And um, I, I did the closest I've come. I, I've given a talk at uh, Madigan Air Force. Air Force Base, military base. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if it's just Air Force, but at Madigan, which is in Washington. Yeah. So I got to meet a lot of, um, you know, yeah, residents and some of the faculty there and uh, heard a little bit about military medicine. It really is a totally different world. Um, right. I do, uh, I will say that <laughs> there seems to be a lot of overlap in the personalities, though with the different doctors. And yeah. So still the same personality types and all the different specialties. I think there's still a little bit there. Yeah, mm. exactly. And uh, people do say that, um, whenever I post a video where like a resident or, or somebody is like kind of being mean to like a resident or, you know, looking down like a surgeon is, mm-hmm. you know, making fun of not making fun of, but you know, yeah. Telling jokes at the expense of the residents of the med students. A comment I get frequently is, oh, wow, it's just like the military. So no. I think there's, you know, <laughs> yeah. kind of the, the well, hazing, hierarchy the and, hazing uh-huh. nature. Kind of, of intense medicine. Yeah. schedule and environment. The hierarchy and, for sure, yeah. definitely. Mm-hmm. It was really great to talk with Dr. Soderdahl and mm-hmm. hear his perspective on things. Uh, let us know what you all thought. Oh, did you find that interesting? Do you want to hear more about the military side of medicine? I sure do. Uh, you can hang out. You can uh, hit us up lots of different ways. Knock, knock, hi at human-content.com. That's our email. You can visit us on all of the social media platforms, and you can hang out with us and our Human Content Podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at Human Content Pods. Shout out to all the great listeners leaving feedback. We love to see those reviews. We we wait. We we just yearn for the the positive reviews. We love seeing them. They make us feel good. You're making us sound very pathetic. Well, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's just, we, we just like them. That's yeah, all. we do like them. All right. I mean, you can leave a bad review if you want, but why would you? Yeah. We're awesome. <laughs> and if you give us a, a good review or subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app, we can give you a shout out. Like today, um, F. Sanjay on Sanjay. F. Sanjay on Spotify said, great episode as always. I always love your content from YouTube to your podcast. As a medical student going through third year rotations, your portrayals are too perfect. Keep it up, Dr. G. 
thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. We also have full video episodes up every week on my YouTube channel at D Glock and Flecken. We also have a Patreon. Fun, cool perks like bonus episodes where we react to medical shows and movies. Hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. We're there. We're doing stuff. Early ad-free episode access. Interactive Q&A live stream events. Also, when we when our live show tickets went on sale. Yes. Right? People got yes. a little little bonus with that they do they get a free uh free vip access to the meet and greet with the purchase of a general admission ticket so yeah. if you want to come to the live show and you're a, a patron you can come to the vip meet and greet for free along with your ticket that you Absolutely. purchase irvine sold out though yes so we have ontario and oxnard i don't know if that will still be true as of the time this airs <laughs> tickets are selling fast so point sure is to get yours do if it you want and, one. and yeah if all these tickets sell and everything we just might have to go on tour elsewhere that's right so it, let us know where you want us to go a lot of reasons to be a patron right now that's um, right we're also having a lot of fun with polls lately in the oh yeah in the patreon community they love a good poll oh who doesn't it's fun love to a good see poll. yeah it's great Patreon.com slash Glockenflecken or go to Glockenflecken.com. Speaking of other Patreon community perks, new member shout out, um, Sadia M, Rishi D, Navid N, Nicole G, Raymond S, Dr. Octane, and Pink Macho. Pink Macho. What a great name. And Dr. Yeah. Octane. Love it. Welcome. Thanks for being patrons. Mm -hmm. And shout out to all the Jonathans, as always. Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Stephen G, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Dr. J, Ross Box, Chaver W, Leah D, K L, Rachel L, Ann P, Keith G, J, J, H, Abby H, Derek N, Jonathan A, Mark, Mary H, Susanna F, and Pink Macho. Hey, some new names in our A Jonathan. virtual head nod to you all. Yes. I want to see how many Jonathans we can get in the Jonathan tier. I know. And, you know, we say their names so many times, they're starting to feel like friends, they right? Are. And You're then we friends. see them in all of the, the events that we do on Patreon. Yes. So it's super fun. Yes, we're getting to know people. Yeah. Uh, Patreon roulette. Random shout out to someone on the emergency medicine tier. So shout out to Nicole G for being a patron. Thanks, Nicole G. Also, thank you all for listening. We're your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glock and Fleckens. A special thanks to our guest today. Dr. Douglas W. Soderdahl. Our executive producers are Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Briggs. I'm sorry. You can never get his I, name. I, I it's felt, so easy, no, no, too. I, I felt like I said Aaron Corney's name wrong, and so I was like, <laughs> did I just say that wrong? But then it bled over into Rob Goldman, and I screwed that up, Rob too. Rob always gets the short end of the stick our here. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portizo. Our music is by Omer Benz V. To learn more about our Knock Knock program, disclaimer and ethics policy, submission verification, licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms. You can go to glockandplugin.com or reach out to us at knockknockhigh at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or any more of those any more of those puns. You guys got one of those puns? 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 Limericks? Puns? Oh, limericks. Haikus? We, got, we had a limerick the other day. Um, that, it was AI-generated. That was AI-generated limerick. I screwed that up, yeah. Um, I didn't realize that. What other jokes? Any other? Uh, uh, you're they? putting me on the spot. I can't think of my what are the other literary types structures. Of, of literary <laughs> <laughs> haikus, yeah, all the things. Uh, 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 doublets, isn't that a thing? Sonnets. Son <laughs> sonnet. Do <laughs> you have any funny sonnets you want us to say on the air here? Uh, knock Knock High is a human content production. Your mom and you. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.